Welcome to Power Up, the uptime podcast focused on the new hot off the press technology that can change the world. Follow along with me, Alan Hall, and Itosaurus Phil Totaro as we discuss the weird, the wild, and the game-changing ideas that will charge your energy future. All right, guys, our first idea is what's termed a stability component for wind turbine blades, and it's an idea from Siemens Gamesa. And in patent form, as they describe it here, it's what they call a novel approach to stabilizing wind turbine blades without the need for traditional trailing edge beam designs. But what they're really doing is they're installing closeout plates on the between the, the aft spar and the, the trailing edge. So uh, it, this idea is pretty much making a wind turbine blade look a lot like an airplane wing, Phil. Yeah, especially like an older style airplane wing. So those that aren't familiar with the closeout plate, it's like a, a rib uh, design uh, that that has this you know vertical element um, at different longitudinal locations throughout the um, kind of the the max cord section and in inner portion with, with the exception of like the the immediate root section of the blade. Um, but it's it's interesting to me you know b- besides uh, just the the general concept here the timing of this was fascinating to me because they filed for this patent um, back in April of 2024 uh, and you know the patent has uh, now published in October and the question is you know is this a, a potential fix to a problem is this uh, you know what's this really doing? Well, it's stopping torsion is what it's doing, Phil. It's preventing the blade from twisting too much, which makes me think of a couple of blades that I'm familiar with that have torsion problems. Joel? Well, if you look at the image here, so I've crawled around in quite a few blades uh, doing RCAs and failures, and you're always looking for failure mode, so you start getting to a different mindset of when you're crawling around in them. But in multiple blades that I've been in, there's an, it, what looks like an extra shear web in the in some of like the max cord region and stuff like that, just to make sure that you keep that part of the shell supported and the, that structure rigid there. And in this design, they're removing that extra shear web and putting these closeout plates in there. And it is exactly like you guys say, the design looks like an airplane wing with a bunch of ribs in it. And to me, in my mind, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a trained structural engineer, but it, from stru- engineering principles and just kind of physics and forces and a little bit of knowledge there, this to me looks like it could solve some, some pretty big issues. However, in maintenance, it makes things a little bit more difficult because maintenance and construction, because it's harder to place these things in construction, of course, uh, and to get them right. You know, we already sometimes have a hard enough time placing shear webs (laughs) and getting those right. Now you're adding perpendicular components and multiple of them. So that makes that a little bit more difficult. Uh, And then, you know, you're checking more glue, glue lines and bond lines and these kind of things. But then, you know, of course, what we've seen in the last two to four years in wind and the explosion of internal inspections. The only way you're going to do an internal inspection on one of these blades is, or from a structured standpoint, is with a, like an Elios drone or something like that, if they can fit through the holes in the closeout panels. Uh, but you're not going to do it with a crawler anymore. So there's some like manufacturing things, some trade-offs with O&M. However, to me, it looks like if you could get this right, you might end up with some more structurally rigid blades uh, that could could alleviate some of these uh, cracking and, and um, blade failure issues we have. Our next idea is from ZF Wind Power and Vestas Wind. And it has to do with uh, gearboxes and preventing electrical currents, stray electrical currents, from damaging the gearboxes, the drivetrain, and causing havoc and warranty claims and all kinds of other things. Uh, as, you, as you pass through a gearbox, there's usually a, a, a tube that sits in the middle of this where you can put hydraulics or electrical signals or whatever you want through them. However, when you put a piece of metal in this in this drivetrain, it provides a pathway for stray currents to flow, and thereby causing uh, damage to the gears and the bearings. And this idea um, from ZF Investus takes that tube and makes it out of plastic. Seems like a really simple change, Phil. It is, but what's interesting about it is a couple of things. First, not only that that kind of um, physical interpretation of um, this idea to just have a, a portion of what would otherwise be a, a metallic 
but non-structural component just changed over to plastic, it might seem like a really simple, stupid idea. Um, but I got to be honest, like a lot of times those are the things that A, are going to help you with maintenance um, or otherwise solve a, a problem that's being caused by the fact that you were using the metal in the first place. The other aspect of this is the fact that because this is a joint um, patent application between ZF and Vestas, this is potentially technology that's already being used on the large onshore machines. Um, we're talking about the V162, V172 kind of product families, uh, or the uh, large offshore machines like the V236 uh, and, and uh, above. Uh, so, you know, the fact that we know that there's a commercial tie-in between ZF and, and uh, Vestas on those, um, those gearboxes means that uh, we hope to be able to see this uh, kind of technology uh, used in, in real-life applications soon. Yeah, Alan and I being a part of the lightning world and, of course, Alan being an electrical engineer, we hear about a lot of problems within turbines with stray voltage, whether it's static buildup or stray voltage coming from the turbine itself, you know, and disregard the idea of even lightning moving around. They can wreak havoc on electronics. They can throw alarms that you don't want to see. They can ruin coatings. It can do all kinds of things. Um, so Vestas and Z ZF looking at fixing this problem. Um, maybe it's something that they, they've learned, a lesson learned from. Uh, or something that they're foreseeing, good on them. Um, and it's good to see innovations like this making their way to the market. All right, our next patent idea is on a rotor blade and, and painting the rotor blade different colors to reduce the visual impact. Now, this is really fascinating. So the concept goes like this. You, you, take, you paint a, a part near the hub, a lighter color, and then as you move out towards the tip, you paint that a darker color, like the color of the sky. So it's blue or maybe even the color of the ground, green or brown uh, to, to match the landscape. So when the rotor is spinning, this color gradation creates an optical illusion uh, that makes the overall rotor diameter appear about 10 to 20 percent smaller than its actual size. Now, the only thing I can compare this to, Phil, is when you walk into a home and they have two different painted colored walls and it, the, the, the shape of the room changes. It's an optical illusion of sorts. It, it sounds like that's what they're headed for in this painting scheme for wind turbine blades. It is. Um, and this, so for those that aren't familiar, this is a patent um, from Enercon. This was originally filed um, in Germany in October 20th, 1999. Um, so we're certainly talking about what is now an expired patent. So if other companies wanted to be able to use this technology, they could. Um, what's interesting about this and the other Enercon patent about, they, they literally patented painting the wind turbine tower, different shades of green. And you may have seen this if you've seen, you know, some of the wind farms in Germany or Austria uh, or elsewhere in, in Europe um, where they've actually implemented this technology. Um, it was part of being a social acceptance uh, of, of um, you know, wind turbines. Uh, and that's that's originally what the, the concept was behind it. Why they patented it is something I still kind of question to this day. Uh, and the reason we're talking about something that's an expired patent in the first place is, you know, we, we have the, the luxury to be able to, you know, look back and say over the last, you know, 20 plus years, uh, has this really been a competitive differentiator for uh, a company like Enercon selling their wind turbines? I'd have to say no. So the, the question of whether or not you want to spend, you know, and, and companies will do this, they'll spend upwards of $400,000 on a single patent over the lifetime of the patent for all the countries that you could potentially go file your patent in. We're talking about, you know, major international markets where you're going to sell wind turbines. That's the U.S., you know, throughout the EU, um, jurisdictions like Brazil, Japan, China, Australia, etc., um, Canada, that you know, other major markets where you're you're going to sell your wind turbines, you're going to spend four hundred grand uh, over the lifetime of the patent to get a patent. So was this four hundred grand well spent? I'd probably have to say maybe not, because while it may have helped in a handful of cases with social acceptance, I it hasn't really served as a as a significant competitive differentiator for uh, for this company. 
I would say if they got this, if it cost them four hundred grand and they got to install one more turbine from it, it was worth it. However, I have never seen one that's painted like this, and I don't believe anybody I know has ever seen one painted like this. So I don't think it's like exactly like you say, Phil. It caught on or it made any value. Uh, the interesting thing in this patent, I'm looking at a section of it, and and I'm going to read it right from the patent so you can all listen. That it, it says uh, it goes set and set and sentence. That is to be achieved in particular in respect of installations with large rotor diameters. And in parentheses, large rotor diameters in 2000 or 99 when this thing was filed was larger than 40 meters. Well, considering the fact that we now have the, <laughs> the Chinese have literally just last week at their China wind power event just proposed a 25 megawatt offshore wind turbine with a 304 meter rotor. So... I think we're, we're beyond the need for painting the tips. 